Getting started with Klabi's workspace caching. Here's today's starting point. I have a Cloud BCI controller version 2.401.3.3. Let's go and take a look at the documentation for Cloudbees workspace caching. What this plugin does is it gives you the ability to use two new pipeline steps. One is called write cache and one is called read cache. Why were these created? As it says right here in the documentation, this is useful for builds running on cloud agents that start with empty caches of build tools or when builds involve temporary files that take much longer to generate than they take to download. So what does this really mean? Well, let's say you're running ephemeral agents within Kubernetes or anywhere else. When you bring up those agents, they usually only have the tooling that you need, but nothing else. Think NPM or Maven or any of the other tools to where you basically need to download the internet in order to get anything done. That's where write cache and read cache come in. So at the time of recording, the only implementation that exists today is for AWS S3. So how do we go about configuring our controller to use these two steps. Well, the first thing that we'll need to do is we'll need to install some plugins. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at the controller, if I take a look at Manage Jenkins and I go to plugins, I've already installed the plugins that are necessary, but let me give you a quick little tip on how to decide which ones to install. I'm going to go over to install plugins and search for S3. Now, the plugin that I installed explicitly was the CloudBees S3 cache plugin. That's the specific implementation to use S3. But when I installed that plugin, it installed all of the other dependencies that it needed. There's a CloudBees cache step plugin. There's also a dependency for S3 cache on the artifact manager on S3 plugin. So by installing CloudBees S3 cache plugin, it brought along all of the other plugins that needed to be installed. So let's go back over to our documentation again. Once we have the plugin installed, we'll need to do some configuration, not only within our controller, but also within S3, because we will need an S3 bucket and also a credential in order to connect up the controller back over to S3. In a few moments, we'll take a look at configuring workspace caching, but let's go ahead and go down to the S3 section. So for the S3 configuration, from a security perspective, I want to have a single user that has access only to an S3 bucket. So what I've already done inside of AWS console, I've created a user that is only going to be connecting up to my bucket. So user, I have credentials set up, and then I have the policy set up that closely mirrors what is in the documentation. Now, in your environment, you may or may not be able to use just a simple access key and secret. You may be using roles or other things. So what I'm going to be showing you now is how I set mine up. The way that you set yours up may be different. And then before we go back over to our controller, let's go ahead and double check our bucket. So I have a bucket. This bucket is referenced in my policy and this policy is applied to this user which has credentials. So if we go back over to our controller, we know that we have the plugins installed. I want to go ahead and go over to my credentials because I need my credentials set up. If I take a look at credentials, I have a AWS type credentials. So if I click on update here, we can see that the access key is this value and the secret access key is hidden. So you can't see that. We see a message saying these credentials are valid, but don't have access to the Amazon EC2 service. Think about the policy that I set up. It only had access to S3, not to EC2. So I'm okay with this message because I have this initial leading sentence. These credentials are valid. Now, again, for my setup, I don't need to set up IAM information. All I needed was my key and secret. Very simple setup. So now that we have our credentials set up, let's go back over to our documentation. We can see that we've gone through the policy and now we're at the point in the documentation to use the steps. But before we do that, we need to go back up top and take a look at the configuration of workspace caching. So if we go back into our controller, click on Manage Jenkins, and then click on System, what we're going to see is a section called Workspace Caching. Now for Workspace Caching, by default, when it's installed, it is set to None because there's no configuration setup. The only option at time of recording is S3 Cache. So if I select this option, I then get some extra information underneath, but the most important part of this is setting up the S3 bucket access settings in AWS configuration. I'm going to open this in a new tab. Now, as that opened up, I'm not going to click on save right now because when we run our pipeline the first time, I don't want to have my caching set up. So I just want to go ahead and make sure that my AWS configuration is set up correctly. 
So in this case, I have an S3 bucket name, which was what we had defined over in the AWS console. Again, for my specific setup, because of how I've got my AWS account set up, I'm not using a base prefix. I don't need a custom endpoint. I don't need custom signing region. For my scenario, I need to disable the session token because I'm not using session tokens. For the Amazon credentials, I needed to select a region and also the credentials that I had already set up on my controller. So with all of this information in place, this is specifically how I had to set up my configuration. Now, how do I know that this works? Over here on the right-hand side, there is a valid date S3 bucket configuration. So once I click on this button, if everything is fine, then what we will see is a message that says success. Before you can go on and do anything else with workspace caching, you have to get this part set up correctly. Said differently, if you don't see success, keep iterating on this until you do get success. Once you have success, then we can go ahead and go take a look at our pipeline. Before we take a look at the pipeline, I want to call out one more thing in the AWS console. Taking a look at our bucket, notice that we have no objects. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and refresh and see that we have no objects in this bucket. Let's go over and take a look at the job that we're going to run. So we'll go back into our controller. Again, I'm not going to save the configuration for workspace caching. I want to leave it none for right now. So I'm just going to leave the page. We'll go into this job and let's take a look at how it's configured. Now the agent that is attached to this controller that's going to be used by this job is a static agent. So in theory, everything could just be left behind and reused for future jobs. But for this example, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be wiping out the workspace every time we run so it imitates what a ephemeral agent might look like. Or even if it's a static agent, I always want to clean up after myself. This will show us how all of this works. So if we take a look at the pipeline, we have a stage for cleaning the workspace. That's what I was just saying. I want to always make sure before I build anything, I want the workspace to be completely wiped out. So I'm just saying clean WS and that completely empties the workspace. Next up, I'm going to be just checking out a repository specifically for the generic webhook trigger plugin. It could be anything, but in this case, I'm just selecting a repository that I know I can build. The next stage is read cache. Now I've included the read cache here and I'm passing in a name and the name is mvn-cache. Let's go back over to the documentation. What we have under the section for using the pipeline steps, we have a write cache and we have a read cache. So if you think about it, if I'm going to use something, I need to read it in. And once I've done everything, I want to write that out. So if we take a look at read cache, the name is a mandatory parameter describing the cache. For example, in this case, Maven repo. Up to this point, since we haven't written anything, when the read cache happens, we expect that to be empty. So we will revisit read cache once we actually turn on our caching. If we go back over to the job, we do our build. Now we're using Maven W, clean verify, but notice here that we're specifying where we want our Maven cache to be. In this case, the dash D Maven repo local, we're pointing it at dot slash Maven dash repo. What this tells Maven, is okay, instead of putting by default into .m2 for whatever the user is, go ahead and put whatever the values you would have put in .m2 into this directory. And this directory will be created during the build time. Now, once we know that this runs and has run successfully, so in this stage, I have a post success. If this builds successfully, then I'm going to go ahead and write out my cache. Notice I'm using MVN cache, which is the same as the name that's used inside of read cache. And then I'm saying includes everything inside of Maven repo. So that way, when we run our read cache, it will put the values of Maven repo back into this workspace. In my case, I don't want to cache everything, just what was gonna be used for Maven. Now also notice that I'm saying post and success. You may want to do post always, or you might want to write cache in a different way. And the way I've set it up at this point, it just makes sense to me. Only when the job built successfully do I want to write my cache. That's a decision that I've made. You may make a different decision. If we go ahead and scroll down a little bit more, I also do a clean workspace at the very end, no matter what. So I do a clean workspace at the very top. I do a clean workspace at the very end. So I'm trying to keep this agent as clean as possible, but that also means I'm potentially downloading the internet every single time I run this job. So I'm going to go ahead and click on save and let's go ahead and click on build now and see what happens.
Now that the job completed, let's take a look at the different sections of the log. We do our clean workspace, no problems there. We take a look at checkout, we see the checkout. If we go to read cache, what we see is workspace caching is currently disabled, so skipping retrieval of the MVN cache, which is what we expected because we have not enabled workspace caching yet on this controller. Then we do the build. Now for the build, this probably looks very familiar. In fact, we're used to seeing downloading the internet, whether you're using Maven, Gradle, SBT, NPM, you name it. We're used to downloading the internet anytime there is a fresh agent that we need to install things on. So again, this took a little bit of time. In fact, this section in total took two minutes and 49 seconds. We also see here, remember we had a post success. Workspace caching is currently disabled, so skipping creation update of the MVN cache cache. So if we were to go back over and take a look at our S3 bucket, we would expect to see no entries there because again, we haven't enabled it yet. Let's go back over to our controller and let's take a look just at a rough number of our stage view is two minutes, 54 seconds for the build and probably overall about just under three minutes to do the whole job. So let's go ahead and go back into our controller. Let's enable workspace caching. So we'll scroll down to workspace caching and we'll change it from none to S3 cache and click on save. We'll click on workspace caching job and click on build now. As we click this, remember it's going to read a cache, but there's nothing there. But at the end, if it's successful, it's going to write the cache. So let's go ahead and click on build now. And now that the job completed, let's go ahead and take a look at the different sections again. For read cache, we're checking the cache context for workspace caching job for cache maven cache. We find that the cache item does not exist, so it continues on building. If we take a look at build, again, we see our normal downloading the internet. The build time is roughly the same, but notice here at the very end, preparing to upload compressed archive for cache maven cache. Uploading the cache, and then it uploaded it in about 98 seconds. Now, notice here it said roughly 2.5 megabits per second. This is a key point. On the network that I'm on right now, I have really great download speeds, but not very good upload speeds. So what I would expect when we run our job again, it's probably going to run a little bit faster, but because of the upload times, the overall job time might take a little bit longer. Let's take a look at the stage view to understand that. So if we take a look at the time we ran here, we had a one second read cache because there was nothing to read. The total build time, including the time to upload the cache, took four minutes and 26 seconds. So this time took a lot longer, even if you compare it to the previous run with no caching. But remember, this one included writing the cache. So what I would expect now that I have a cache, and in fact, if we go over to S3, and if I take a look at the objects within this bucket, I now see an entry for this cache if I click into that, there's a directory, and this directory has a file, 247 meg. If we take a look back at our log, what we'll see is that the file size is that 247.92, which is the same as what we see over in S3. Now, I want to call this out while we're talking about this. When you have a cache file, notice these names are effectively nonsensical. It's cache-4f6 that then leads to a directory tvrr that leads to a file bxzu. Now, before we go on, let's go back over to our documentation. I want to call out an item under the pipeline section called cache contexts. Caches are scoped to the pipeline that created them. In our pipeline, we created a cache named mvn-cache. That means that that name can be used anywhere else because that mvn cache is scoped to my job, workspace cache job. Taking a look right here, my workspace caching job, that cache that exists in S3 will only work within this job. However, there is one exception and builds for pull requests in a multi-branch pipeline will be able to read but not write the cache of the job. So in my case, I'm not using a multi-branch, I'm just using a standard pipeline job. But if you needed to be able to pull in that cache, then builds for pull request will be able to read that cache but not write back out. Now, one more thing I want to take a look at before we go back and run the job one final time, let's take a look at this file itself. Very standard file inside of S3. But if we scroll down to the metadata section, we're going to see four items included in the metadata. 
We have a job name that gives us our job name. We know which build number it was. So this was build number 21. If we take a look back here, this was build number 21. The Jenkins URL gives us the URL to our Jenkins controller. And then there's also a UUID that's included. So by taking a look at the object within S3, we have three items to where we can track back to where this cache belongs. In this case, on the CM11 controller in the workspace caching job job, build number 21 was where this file was created. So let's go ahead and go back over one final time to our controller. Let's run the job and see where it lands. Now remember, on my network, I have a great download speed, but not a great upload speed. So we have to keep those two things in mind when we take a look at the overall build number. Let's go ahead and click on build now. And now that the job completed, let's take a look at read cache. With read cache, we were checking the cache context for this job for cache maven cache. We found it. It downloaded the 947 meg. Once it downloaded it, it did the extraction in seven seconds and then completed. So basically this whole time from 13 to 29 was a total of roughly 16 seconds. Now let's take a look at our build step. Normally that had been taking anywhere between two and a half and three minutes. This time, the total time, instead of being two and a half to three minutes was 51 seconds. If we scroll up a little bit, we don't see that we were downloading the internet because everything that was necessary came down in that cache file. Now still notice here at the end, we did a write cache back, still the same size, it took about 96 seconds. Let's go ahead and go back to our stage view. And what we'll see here is even with the upload, we still beat our time at two minutes and 31 seconds. Now, by the time you factor in the read cache, that took 15 seconds. But if you think about this one, this is the one we really need to compare against. We did not have a cache at all, and we wrote a cache in four minutes and 26 seconds. Since we had a cache when we ran the next one, we had 15 seconds plus two minutes and 31 seconds, so roughly two minutes and 45 seconds down from the four minutes and 26 seconds. Now you may have been hearing some it depends throughout this video. How good is the network on the upload? How good is the network on the download? How fast are the drives on my agents? How performant is the CPU on my agents? By implementing write cache and read cache in your pipelines, you should see a performance increase in how your jobs run. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to us on Twitter at CloudBees. If this video was helpful to you, give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to CloudBees TV yet, why not? Take a moment, click on that subscribe button, and then ring that bell, and you'll be notified anytime there's new content available on CloudBees TV. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.